I call the June 27th, 2022 school board meeting to order. It is 8 p.m. We are in conference room C of the Fisher Administration Building at 12121 West North Avenue. <coughs> Ms. Newman, would you please call the roll? Ms. Fraley, present. Dr. Hoyt, here. Dr. Jessa Banger, here. Mr. Meyer, here. Ms. Willis, here. Mr. Phillips, here. Ms. Newfeld, here. Public comment on non-agenda items. Members of the Wauwatosa School Board value the input of students, parents, staff members, and community members. The board's regularly scheduled meetings provide an opportunity for opinions and concerns to be expressed publicly. The board values all comments and will respectfully consider this input in decision making. The board requests that individuals limit their comment on each item to three minutes. Following any comment, an individual board member may respond on the issue raised. However, it is not the intent of public comment portion of our agenda for the board to enter into a debate with members of the community. Because non-agenda items are not publicly posted in advance, no action will be taken on public comment regarding non-agenda items this evening. Is there any public comment on non-agenda items in the room. Seeing none, are there any online? There are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Our uh, first content item is the oath of office for a new school board member. Dr. Joseph Banger, please. Please raise your right hand. I. I. Jessica Willis. Jessica Willis. Having been elected or appointed to the office of school board member of the Wauwatosa School District. Having been elected or appointed to the office of school board member of the Wauwatosa School District. But have not yet entered upon the duties thereof. But have not yet entered upon the duties thereof. Swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin. Swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the state of Wisconsin. And will faithfully discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. And will faithfully discharge the duties of said office to the best of my ability. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we welcome Ms. Willis to her seat at the table um, to fill our seat number seven uh, vacancy. Thank you very much. Ms. Meekle, can I make a comment over here? Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt. Um, well, welcome, um, Ms. Willis. We're super excited to have you here. I, as a other new board member, um, just want to uh, kind of put a, a conversation point out here as you know thinking about what the last two years have probably been like for for those of you who have been on the board for that period of time um, where there hasn't really been any opportunity to stop and breathe now that we have two new board members um, I think this is really a, an opportunity to pause and reflect and um, kind of reset um, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and kind of recalibrate. As I've said before, um, I know we had talked about doing this during perhaps a special board meeting in the future, but I personally would love to do it sooner than August um, to have an opportunity to talk through, you know, what are the roles and responsibilities of a governance board. What are the committees that are that exist? Um, how do you get things on the agenda? All of these kind of orientation things, but also part of it is just again recalibrating and creating kind of a shared cultural, shared experience, a shared culture um, for the board. So it's just something I would like to kind of talk through and maybe. Um, see if there's opportunities during regular board meetings when we're all together we don't have to call a special board meeting but just an opportunity for for us to kind of add this to our regular agenda um, so that we can learn and grow together thank you any other board comment mr meyer sure i'll endorse those thoughts 
that um, long ago, the in-service sessions where we did our learning as a board were held on weekends, maybe some 15 years ago or so. Now it's, it's, you know, people's lives are different. It's more difficult to get those weekend times. And in that, in that sense, about 12 years ago, we started um, holding in-service sessions after the regular board meeting because people were already here for the regular board meeting. So we had to like talk about stuff and people were here to your point, um, Dr. Hoyt. So I, you know, we, we, we would have to be very economical and disciplined on our regular agenda so that we don't use up everybody's energy <laughs> and we have time to get to the learning topics later in the evening. But I certainly would hope we could agenda something sooner than August, especially considering to essentially new board members and congratulations for Dr. Hoyk for no longer being the newest board member. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's important. There's a lot to learn and I need as a long serving board member to be refreshed on many things as well as all professions do. There's continuing education to refresh our knowledge because things go stale, especially in my old head. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Justbanger. I would certainly support that. Um, I also want to welcome you to the board um, and also share that we had some phenomenally talented um, folks, uh, yourself and several others, who took the risk of putting their names forward, putting themselves forward to serve the community. Uh, and I hope each of them continue to do so. Uh, so thank you so much for stepping into this role. Congratulations. And thank you to the others who put their names forward. And it's a, it's a big, scary thing to do, um, to kind of uh, do that. And we were incredibly um, fortunate tonight to have so many wonderful members of our community who were so thoughtful in their presentations and their materials they submitted. Um, it, I, I was really deeply impressed. So congratulations. Um, can't wait to work with you as we move the district forward. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Willis, Yes. would you like to make any other comments? I would. Um, very much to what Jenny said, I am open and willing and ready to learn as much as I can to be as effective as I can in this role. Um, so I welcome the opportunity to do those end services and learn as much as I can um, so that I can do this to the best of my ability. I also want to echo it, but Ms. Mr. Joseph Anger said, um, it was an extraordinary group of candidates that applied tonight, uh, so much so that I was intimidated after you know hearing some of their speeches, but I am excited and honored to be in this role. I look forward to working with all of you and to serving this district. So thank you very much. Thank you. And again, congratulations and welcome. Um, just uh, for calendaring purposes, since it came up, um, the uh, current idea is to host an, uh, an in-service of this uh, sort as soon after August 1st as we possibly can. August 1st is the date that we are able to have our um, WASB training um, for ethics, open records, and open meetings, um, among other uh, topics, shared leadership. So, um, but if board members have other ideas, you know, certainly bring them forward. Well, wonderful. Um, the next topic we have is a recognition of our student school board representatives. And I am not certain we, they were able to attend this evening, but we do want to sincerely thank them for their service. Um, their lives get very busy, obviously, after graduation and uh, and all of the things that they're doing um, in their lives. So um, I just sincerely want to thank them and then open this up um, to other board members to to, to comment and um, and make any remarks at this time. We'll also um, share a plaque that we will be giving them. Uh, 
Um, so they're not here, but I do think it's important to just have it reflected in the record how much their voice really matters um, and how, um, you know, it's one thing to read, you know, the student newspapers, which I try and do um, and go to student events. Um, but it's a whole other thing to have kids put themselves out there to stay very, very late <laughs> on many evenings um, and to, to put out what we need to remember, which is, you know, a lot of times people say, you know, our constituents are the community members. And while I agree with that to a point, I ultimately believe our number one constituent are the kids. And um, sometimes when we're trying to please adults, we trod on kids and and I was just so grateful for their willingness to sometimes like raise unpopular ideas um, or to share that while they thought they knew what they were getting into but boy you know this was different than they thought it would be so I hope it was really great learning experience for them as Ms. Mewfeld says we'll be able to pass along our written thoughts to them and with a um, a plaque of our appreciation, but really, really grateful for all four of these young people who put themselves forward. And I would just say to parents who are listening and community members that will be looking for our next class of kids um, first of the school year. So start putting that idea in your, your children's heads as to something they might want to explore. Thank you, Ms. Fraley. Any other school board? sentiments before we uh, display the plaque. Ms. Newman, would you do the honor of displaying the <laughs> plaques for us? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, we have two students um, that represented East High School for us in the 2021-22 20, uh, school year, Nadia Ewell and Kay Pluda. And also two students um, that represented Wauwatosa West High School, Ella Archambault and Will Florio. Amazing young people. And they've given us so much to think about. Um, so again, we're looking for more students. Please encourage your students uh, to apply. And um, it, it's really a growth opportunity for us too, as board members. And we we listen to them. Um, we listen to them, and and it's invaluable. So, congratulations again. Moving on uh, to the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda which board members would like to remove for separate discussion and action? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Jess Banger. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Fraley. Is there any board discussion? Seeing none, is there any uh, community comment on the consent agenda? I don't see anyone in the room. Mr. Price, are there any comments online? There are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Ms. Newman, would you please call the roll? Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Our next topic is a school board action item related to the school safety resolution. Dr. Hoy, please. It is recommended that the school board approve the school safety resolution and I so move. Is there a second? I second. Thank you, Dr. Just Banger. Is there any uh, board discussion we had uh, a presentation at our last meeting. No board discussion. Um, we just did have one addition of um, adding the word safety after um, after one of the paragraphs to clarify. So I think the only comment I would have is 
there have been certainly several uh, members of the community who've been kind of calling for and pushing for. I think this board, since well before the pandemic, has been advocating and pushing for. Um, Ms. Mufeld, you've been certainly doing a lot of work with district leadership and, and staff. So thank you to those who work to pull this together and move it forward. Um, I think this is one of many things that we'll be moving forward with, I suspect, over the next um, year and going forward. So thank you to all the advocates in the community, on the board, and the, in the district. Uh, who've been doing this work for a long time. Uh, I want to recognize that, and I'm glad that um, we're continuing to do additional work. So thank you. Thank you. And also we'll have, uh, I would say, the Legislative Advocacy Committee engaged, um, along with community members as well on this topic. Um, is there any community comment on this action? I don't see any in the room. Are there any online, Mr. Price? No, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, may I have roll call then, Ms. Newman? Ms. Bailey? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes, thank you. Uh, the next uh, action items is under uh, human resources. Um, the first is administrative contract, Whitman Middle School principal, uh, Dr. Tuspanker. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2022-23 administrative contract of Sarah Danich. Did I pronounce that correctly? Dionich, my apologies, as principal of Whitman Middle School, effective July 1st, 2022, for 229 days per year at an annual salary, salary of $115,000, and I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Braley. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Jennifer Foch, Director of Human Resources for the district. We're really excited to have Ms. Dianich here tonight. Um, we know she's a proven building leader. Um, she brings with her plenty of instructional expertise. Um, she's a pioneer in school safety and mental health initiatives as well, and really um, glowing reviews about the relationships she's able to foster um, in her time as a leader and as a teacher. So um, she is here tonight if you would like to hear from her as well. Um, Ms. Dianish, would you like to make any comments? Well, thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm very, very excited to be a part of the district. I'm excited to get to know everyone. And um, I'm thrilled to be able to start my role as Whitman Middle School Principal. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I'm sure I'll be seeing a whole lot of you moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any further board discussion on this item? Seeing none, is there any community comment? None in the room, Mr. Price? No, there are no hands raised. And no comment online. Um, may I have a roll call? Ms. Braley? Yes. Dr. Hoyg? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mufeld? Yes. And we're very happy to have you. Congratulations. Our next item under human resources is the administrative contract for the Director of Data Quality and Analytics, Dr. Hoy. It is recommended that the school board approve the 2022-23 administrative contract of Suzanne Thomas as Director of Data Quality Analytics, effective July 18, 2022, for 229 days per year at an annual salary of 120,000. And I so move. Thank you, is there a second? I second. Thank you. Ms. Bott. We're very lucky to be able to bring Ms. Thomas uh, to the district. She understands truly um, how to use data at not only the classroom level, but the district level. And she's adept at working with teams to help them become more data literate and make decisions that are student centered and uh, affect student achievement as, um, as well. So we're very excited to have her here tonight as well. Oh, wonderful. Ms. Thomas, would you? 
like to step to the microphone. Sure. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm thrilled to be joining the Wauwatosa School District. Um, and this is this talented and driven lean um, team of Dr. Means, Dr. Marble, Mr. Brightman, and Ms. Foch. And it's really an honor to serve with you. I'm, um, I'm driven to help improve the your culture of data literacy so that everyone has the skill sets and mindsets and tools to really make do their best work for kids. So thank you for having me. Thank Question, you. Question, please. Um, could you share with the public some of your qualifications in um, data quality and analytics? I'm not sure everybody exactly knows what that is. Sure, I'll give you a brief overview, overview of my career pathway and then some of my skill sets. So I, um, I started out as a math teacher in Minneapolis and then moved to Menominee Falls. So I've served as a math teacher at the middle and high school level, then instructional coach, building administrator and district leader. Um, but along along the way, I um, I really had the opportunity to grow in, a, in a, a district devoted to continuous improvement. So I've seen that from all the lenses. Um, I have, I'm certified in project management. I'm a Lean Six Sigma black belt, which is um, unique for, uh, somewhat unique for um, the education sector. And really, so I have the statistical tools to apply to problem solving in education, which I think is a really unique lens to, um, to the education field. Oh, if I may. Yes, lean, sir. Lean six <laughs> you had him at Sigma lean, Six. <laughs> lean Six Sigma black belt is rather hard to achieve. Could you describe for the public a little bit about what your project was and how long that takes? And the, there's a big progression you have to go through to reach the black belt level, for example. Sure, sure. So um, um, in Menominee Falls, we have a partnership with WC, uh, an incredible partnership with WCTC um, to get this training, which really was rooted in manufacturing. So. Um, we, I started out with, um, you know, there's levels of training. So a yellow belt, then orange belt, green belt. And, um, and you know, that happened over the course of three years. Um, but uh, my biggest project was really um, around student, student attendance and, and how to tackle that from um, a lens that really, so, so you actually know your changes made an improvement. Um, sorry, that wasn't very in depth, but I haven't. <laughs> that's been that's been a while. But um, that was the the problem I tackled. But along the way, I've supported teams in improving early literacy, um, math, some of our programming. You know, really, the tools can be applied to to a lot of different processes. And and your project management certification is that from the. That was also from WCTC. Okay, um, and what is it? The, is there a project management institute, or um, I'm not up to date on that. Yeah. Do you know what? And that one, um, there are a few different organizations okay. where you could be certified through. So um, we just took the course through through WCTC, mm -hmm. um, and along the way, we've we've been able to um, to take a number of our team members in both the operations and instructional side of side of the organization organization through project management and really developed um, a program that was specific to our needs in education where people could tackle projects using their project management tools and get some coaching along the way. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm very pleased that you're deciding to come on board with us. Oh, thank, thank you. you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> thank you. Is there any other board comment? Seeing none, is there any community comment? Seeing none in the room, uh, Mr. Price? No, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you then. Uh, Ms. Newman, would you please call the roll? Ms. Braley? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes, and welcome. Very happy to have you. Another critical role. Um, our next item this evening is human resources report on staff retention, uh, Dr. Means and so we did, this is similar information shared uh, with the community last week, Wednesday, and also has been available on the board doc. So I'm just gonna give a brief overview of the information that's already been shared. We know nationwide um, there is a teacher shortage and that teachers are choosing to leave their, 
to the profession and thus retention is an issue. Um, the National Education Association has reported uh, 600,000 teachers have left the profession since January of 2020. Um, we have experienced increased turnover here in Wauwatosa. Um, currently, um, our turnover rate after the 21-22 school year is 16%. The exit survey data that we have received indicates that the three reasons folks are leaving the profession in the district are leaving the profession um, and not working in education. Um, they are working for another district or they have retired. Um, we know from some of our engagement data that 13% uh, of our teaching staff were dissatisfied or satisfied with their pay. So that's incredibly low. Um, we did adopt, as um, we did in March, the new compensation system to address uh, concerns about pay moving forward. We know that that couldn't um, correct everything wrong in, a, in one short school year. But uh, moving forward with the single lane system, we do feel that's very transparent, professional, it's objective. It gives people a clear path forward and that guaranteed 3% every step should help as well, along with their retention provisions after years three, seven, and 15. Um, the other information share were breakdown of our vacancies. So some of our vacancies were created because we had new positions, particularly at the elementary. We had uh, several new SK positions, senior kindergarten, and then we had new positions funded through our ESSER monies as well. Um, so that breakdown was shared in the earlier communication. Um, we communicated that we had 61.92 FTE to hire as of this afternoon. That's down to 57.92. And I know, um, I think anywhere between five and seven offers were made today through the Division of Human Resources to teachers as well. Um, we've been transitioning with our new Chief of Talent, Ms. Elizoski, to streamline some of our processes to make onboarding a little more swift so we don't lose candidates. We haven't experienced a huge loss of candidates at this point, um, and, but we, the, we know that the um, more streamlined our process can be and, and the more quickly we can get to an offer, the, the, the better. Um, and um, that in, in tandem with the new compensation system. Um, feedback anecdotally that I've received when I made offers, um, the folks coming on board are really excited about being part of that new system. And um, we know that our community are our best recruiters. So anything our community can do is spread the word um, about the benefits of working in Wauwatosa. We know in addition to compensation, our benefits are still competitive in terms of the package as well. Um, but we are facing the same challenges that many other districts across Wisconsin and across our nation are facing with uh, smaller pools of applicants. Um, and that's been a trend that we've seen over the last few years as well. Thank you. Are there any board questions or comments? Dr. Lynn? Do you have thoughts about what else would help us to retain teachers aside from some of the salary and compensation things that we've already tried to kind of address? Um, anecdotally, um, I know there's a lot to be said about the work-life balance, so anything that we can do to support our staff, um, we could um, leverage some more of our EAP relationship, I think, um, in providing some services that is open to anyone in the household of a district um, employee, but we do have um, some professional learning hours that come through our contract that we haven't leveraged as well as we might, so that might be one place um, just to help folks find some balance and some outlets for things. And is there a, a pipeline to try to generate new, new interest in teaching so that we're getting more people to enter into education? I mean, I think that's, this is sort of, you know, short-term, long-term plan. Yep, we do need to explore that uh, further. I'm the first one to admit that, that I didn't get as far as I would like to this year on that particular project. I am happy to say that we have hired some of our paraprofessionals as teachers. So there is an interest in staying with the district. Um, and I think we need to figure out if we can find a relationship with a college or university to provide the licensing. Um, but some of that is exceptionally costly in terms of tuition. So uh, costly for the employee and be costly for the district. So we need to find some sort of uh, happy medium there. But that's definitely something we know we should explore. Ms. Willis. I have a question. So do we have partnerships with local colleges uh, for student teaching programs? Like, do we have? We don't have dedicated partnerships, but we had, um, I just today uh, was asked, I think we had 133 student teachers this year in the district, and we have hired some of those student teachers. So um, our student teachers do want to come back to work for us, um, as evidenced by the fact that we've been able to hire. Sure. Um, but we do, um, we have 
folks that come from out of state to student teach in, in the local areas as well. And what about job fairs or recruitment fairs? Um, do those provide a lot of opportunities or recruit any candidates that way? Uh, Dr. Marble and I actually attended a job fair through our local CISA in, I think it was March or April, I can't remember at this point. Um, uh, they're not as well attended as they used to be, uh, but we have taken advantage of them when the opportunity presents. Okay, thank you. We actually ran our own uh, job fair in November. <clears throat> so most school districts typically run their job fairs in the traditional springtime. We ran ours in November and then we hired a few mm -hmm. uh, candidates who attended. Is that something worth considering? Maybe having another job fair oh, we'll this summer? Yeah, like our own dedicated Absolutely. district job fair? Yes. And I wondered too, I mean, just an idea. I know in the district that um, I came from, we tapped into a lot of local agencies. Like for instance, I know there's a Black Caucus educator of Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. So like a group of educators, you know, just tapping into some of those organizations, um, you know, that obviously have uh, educators in them just to bring them into our district and give them more information about working for our district. Yeah. We were proud to be, I, other than Milwaukee Public Schools, I think we had a very good representation. Milwaukee Metropolitan of Black School Educators um, is, they host the largest teacher gala during the Teacher Appreciation Week. And um, we had all of our principals identify candidates um, and award winners for that, that gala, um, the, the title of Milwaukee Metropolitan of, of Black School Educators doesn't negate um, people of all creeds and colors to, to be part of the organization, but um, we're, we're, we're tapped in with them. Our school district is also one of the founding uh, school districts for an organization by the name of Closing the Achievement Gap Consortium. Um, and, and we collaborate with other school districts in the metro area that are focused on closing the, the persistent achievement gap. Um, but also what we do with that, that consortium is that we, we offer new teacher orientation um, and with the lens of you will be working in a more diverse uh, school system. And so how will you embrace it? Um, there's also a, an annual school board symposium uh, for all the school board members of those school districts to come together, people uh, like that very much. We, Wallatosa, have been the host of that symposium um, uh, for many years. So there are a few ways where we, we collaborate with other uh, local agencies. Uh, but to your, your question around the, the pipeline, mm -hmm. I, I think what the research is showing us is that we're going to have to become more aggressive in creating our own pipeline. Um, the, the old adage or the old way of recruiting teachers of assuming they're going to come to you um, is just not working anymore. Uh, there's, I think they changed their name now, but there's an organization in the metro area called MTEC. And MTEC allows you to identify some of our educational assistants to go through an accelerated um, accreditation program so they can become teachers. Um, and they encourage school districts to identify in particular, your educational assistants of color um, to create a wider pipeline quicker. Uh, because if we are, if we're waiting on that that pipeline of teachers of color to emerge quickly in Wisconsin, every school district is struggling in that space. So those are some strategies that we're continuing to focus on. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring us back to the strategic planning process. So one of the five. Uh, pillars of the strategic plan is high quality staff. <clears throat> and there have been uh, community members and staff members who've been part of that subgroup. They've come up with really interesting suggestions on what should be objectives that eventually the board will have to wrestle with and, and hopefully even support at some point. Um, but some of their suggestions are that we we have someone who is more dedicated to recruitment um, year round. That is just not an episodic uh, event, but it's more year round. That we look at other benefits. We know that our health and dental benefits are some of the richest and and, and better uh, packages in the metro area, but are there opportunities for us to find athletic club memberships and spa discounts and um, 
they even put in their car maintenance uh, discounts, which I would care. really love. Um, but they, 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 they put those items in uh, the, the suggestions as well. Some of the feedback from that subgroup was that we haven't done a good job with our professional development offerings. It has been, again, emphasized. We haven't said, here's what we're going to train you and support you in and becoming a better teacher. Um, it's really depending on what school you're in or if it happens at all. Uh, I think we've talked about that a little bit with our adoption of a new ELA curriculum. We didn't do our due diligence at the administrative level and, and making sure that, that training was available to all staff. Teachers want to be good. They want support. Uh, and so having a better, and Dr. Margo and I have had the conversation, having a very deliberate list of professional development opportunities uh, is another option. Um, and then again, I would, again, we, we would, Ms. Foch has mentioned this, but uh, we're proud of the work that we did in conjunction with our union. Um, I, I, we understand that in this environment, we didn't have to collaborate with our, our colleagues from the Walt Tulsa Education Association, but we did. And I think it made our new salary system a stronger system. It's not where we want to be. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't address all the needs that are uh, out there right now, but uh, it was clearly a step in the right direction. Sorry for no. jumping in on your presentation. Yeah. Ms. Fraley, um, so a couple things. One, uh, something that we've tried recently where I am is uh, online. So it's not a job fair, but it's like an info session and offering specific targeted ones and then just ones that are open to anyone. And that has been helpful in terms of people's time and energy and that people just can't get places that, you know, they used to, get, you know, we've had people literally sitting in their cars in info sessions at their kids' sporting events, listening, and then they, you get them excited enough to take that next step. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, which I think you just said, Jenny, which is daycare. I know this sounds crazy, but the high school I went to, um, we actually had a, a daycare in our high school that you were able to take early childhood classes that ended up helping you get your um, early childhood certificate. And I had not thought about this in literally 30 years. And on vacation, it came up because... One of my kids said, didn't you have a, a preschool in your high school? And I said, oh yeah, we did. But what was, what I didn't know when I was in high school that I found out much later is that all the kids that were there, they were all district parents. Um, I just thought it was like neighborhood preschool. Um, but it got me thinking on vacation, like, could that be a strand of launch? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, where we're creating a, an actual benefit for, for school district staff that is different than, you know, spa giveaways or discount on the can. Not that people don't appreciate that, but I think what people need is less stress in their day-to-day -day life. Um, not, they don't have time for the little extras. So I wanted to throw that out there. And then the last thing is that, well, I appreciate all of the ideas about um, recruitment, which is definitely a need and everybody has that need. I think we actually need to be spending a lot of time on retention because salary matters. But school culture is what I think we have to solve for because teachers, teachers will stay if they feel cared for, if they feel like they're getting good PD, if they feel like their district leaders are listening to them and the data that we have is not demonstrating that. So I think one of the things we have to think about is that every year we put new things on teachers and we never take anything away. I would love it if we would go into a school year and go with the less is more and do less better. Like how do we pick like core skills or core behaviors that we really want to double down on and then see if that helps teachers really get in and meet the needs of all kids and, and differentiate and things like that. Um, and I know there's a ton of needs right now, but I just feel like we keep piling it on and giving folks the opportunity to go to a spin class, you know, outside of school is not going to, what I keep hearing from people I work with is like, I don't have time for self-care because I actually don't have time to actually get my whole job done. So I would love us to think about beyond your office, how are we actually creating a sustainable job that when they talk to their friends and their friends' kids, they don't say to a kid graduating from high school, don't go into education because that's what I hear sometimes happening. 
where people are like active teachers are actively telling kids who are interested in being teachers don't do that to yourself and that just pains my heart because these are people who love what they do but they're just getting worn out mr meyer so i'll piggyback on that not to suggest that anybody's going to agree with what i'm going to say but anecdotally i hear that a big root cause is the administration in the Fisher Building here. That administrators continuously come up with shiny new consulting driven programs and expect the teachers to drop their core emphasis and their core trainings and their core focus and run to various seminars about the next new shiny thing that the Fisher Building wants them to do. So I'm not as nearly as sophisticated as Ms. Fraley in describing what the things we keep piling on are. But um, anecdotally, in my layperson terms, um, it's not about the next program that administrators can think of coming out of the Fisher Building to pile on more tasks. It's whatever Mrs. Fraley was referring to about doing, and you could describe it much better than me, I'm sure. There's a, they're very good at their job and we need to let them do the job. The other thing is the, the burdens of student behavior. And again, that's sourced to administration as well, that we are getting quite a reputation I hear for a district that can't maintain student behavior because of lack of support from the central office and teachers are just tearing their hair out and getting frustrating and just needing to go somewhere else. Now, all these are anecdotal statements. We have a brand new, shiny, very well-qualified data, data analyst who might be able to get to the bottom of this by asking the right questions to discern exactly what it is that is the frustration that if these anecdotal statements have some validity to them that we can discern exactly precisely what the issues are. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other board comment? Madam Chair. Yes. I Dr. Mead. So in my, in my entry to the role last year, I met with everyone except for Ms. Willis, but I met with all the board members and this is the same feedback you provided me. So this year there was no new program. There was no, so I want to be very clear for the 21, 22 school year, First of all, we, we didn't have enough staff members to even implement a new program, but uh, there was no new program that we introduced. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I, I think we constructed our new, with our ESSER funds and with the district office support staff, we're trying to get more support out to the buildings. I'll, I'll talk about the third rail topic that isn't really discussed when you talk about school culture a lot. It's easier to say the district when you have these conversations versus really drilling down to what does school leadership look like? And so this year, we've actually spent a lot of time building the capacity of our building principals. I like to use the, the terminology that when you are a principal or a parent of a school, you live in that school community. And, and so it's easier to say, well, Dr. Marble and the Fisher people versus really drilling down and saying, how will my specific principal provide training for my classroom teachers in my school to make sure that they're doing their work well? It's a relationship, and so when principals are really honed in on what their school growth plans are going to be and what their, 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 where, where they're going to focus their improvement work, that clarifies where we as a district team can help support and uplift. We haven't created, the, we haven't trained our principals, um, nor created the expectation that those school growth plans are really critical uh, to school culture and school um, growth. And, and so I'm really proud of the work that we did this past year in developing uh, our principles and, and clarifying those expectations. Thank you, Dr. Means. 
Um, from my perspective, there's internal actions and there's external actions. We definitely are in a crisis situation with educators. It's a national crisis, it's a regional crisis, and Wauwatosa is really in competition with other school districts, unfortunately, we are. I don't like that we're in that position, but we are. And so um, how we can do our best, uh, you know, to retain those teachers. I'm not sure if any of you have seen the PBS series. There is a PBS series on, and Wauwatosa was mentioned. <laughs> so in our efforts to raise the teacher compensation um, as one of our strategies um, to try to, you know, retain and, and attract. Um, so certainly that's ongoing work. Um, could you help me with the timing? You can come back to us since this is such a critical area. We have a new team in HR. Uh, you know, when can you come back with the, to us with, you know, some more? Ms. Elizowski starts Friday. Okay. That's really a deciding week because people will start assuming their jobs. And in uh, the pre-orientation of Ms. Elizowski serving as our chief of talent, uh, we have landed on the space that this will be uh, a monthly report to the board. Uh, so the board doesn't have to ask for the data. We'll, we'll make it a monthly report. And if you uh, need to, con I think we need to continue the conversation that Ms. Elizowski will be available. I would be, if I may, Madam, Madam Chair, we know through our our data research that our teacher salaries salaries not total compensation but our teacher salaries are woefully behind the metro area uh, we are we are keenly aware and if money was not an object if mr brightman wouldn't say stop you can't spend that much uh we we would invest the money that we we need to we realize if you compared the salary of what an average wall Tulsa teacher is receiving versus the type of school districts that we want to compare ourselves to, we're, we're not where we want to be right now. Um, but the board has been very clear with me that we have to do it in incremental steps. We can't do it, we can't do it all at once. Uh, we don't have the financial ability to do it. And even if we did, the ability to sustain it will be important. Um, Ms. Greenfield referenced the Legislative Advocacy Committee uh, earlier this evening. It's important for the community to know that at the state legislature level, with the last biannual budget, there was a $0 per pupil increase. And so that does limit the ability for school districts to have these types of conversations when when we, we talk about uh, compensation and resources. Thank you. Thank you, and the teacher pipeline, really encouraging young people to go into the profession. That's, um, that's a very critical as well, because there is no time than now where this is so important with retirements. And I mean, we need the best people with our children. And I know that our community supports us. Um, and and um, so I appreciate the community members who have um, brought information to us. That's really important. And our response to it, um, I'm very happy to hear you say we're going to be updated on a very regular basis. So thank you. Is there any other board comment? Yes, Dr. Jespinger. One of the things we've talked about in the past is retention interviews, uh, and particularly for staff we have that we know are highly successful in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I'd be really interested to hear what things that we might be doing and need to do to retain the talent that we have. So that's something I think as we go forward, I would love to have kind of a, a board to cover the board of things that we would benefit from having in place to achieve that goal. Um, I would also like to say thank you to you, um, Ms. Bosch. You have done incredible work this year, a lot of challenges. Um, the, the number of positions that we have searched for, the number of supports that you put in place um, in what has been an incredibly challenging year, I want to thank you because um, your, your work has been noticed and appreciated. Thank you. 
Thank you. That concludes our report this evening, and we will come back to this next month in July. Um, Madam Chair, just one last thing is, yes. but, and thank you, Dr. Jessup Anger, for noticing uh, Jenny was thrown into the deep end, uh, <laughs> and um, that was before we even had all the vacancies. And her work um, was really uh, incredible when we had the vacancies with our new processes of including more people. Um, I think we heard positive results of our new process. Um, didn't get a chance to share that Ms. Mufo was part of the final interview process at the, um, the district level for Ms. Deanich and the, the Whitman principal job. So that, that added component of having the board part of the process, I'm really appreciative of board members making the time. Um, but I, I just, I wanted to share with you that ultimately that this, this work of addressing our, our stay interviews is going to be uh, a really important component to this work that we know and realize. Uh, we call them stay interviews. We wanna know why people are staying um, and, and recognize why people are staying. Um, it's a tough position to be uh, a, an educator. Um, there's varying opinions on what it looks like, um, but we are, if there are areas where we can improve, we want to improve. Um, but I, I would just like to conclude, we, we tried to demonstrate this year that we were listening to people, ranging from the collaboration with the, the Waltos Education Association to develop a new set system um, to um, the, super, the Superintendent Advisory Council, uh, Teacher Advisory Council that I have. We've, been, we've continued to listen to people and, and have tried within our, our means uh, to, to meet their, their concerns. All right, have we met them all? No, um, and, but we're, we're open to trying to figure out how we can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fodge. Your, your work is sincerely appreciated. And thank you to the entire staff and teams in the district. Um, without you, we couldn't do this work with children. Um, teaching and learning report, uh, action items, action items, more action items. <laughs> and so Madam Chair, as uh, um, Dr. Marble can come to the microphone if you need her to, but um, just for the public's sake and, and to review for the board, you went to a pace and cadence, uh, I wanna say around February or so, um, where, and Mr. Meyer and Ms. Munifel can address this, there was a time period in the district where the first meeting was always, always the first reading of items and the review of things, and the second meeting was more of a approval. Um, so we, we come to you this evening with all the action items, uh, with, with uh, the, the mindset of if you have questions, final questions, we would, we would be more than happy to address them, but otherwise we, um, we would assume that the discussion that took place on June 13th um, met your your governance threshold. Okay, thank you. So moving on to the action items for teaching and learning, the um, and I, I do think it's important to frame that um, for the community. Approval of the Chromebook purchase, Mr. Phillips. Sure. It is recommended that the school board approve the Chromebook purchase as presented on the June 13th, 2022 meeting, and I so move. Second. Thank you, Dr. Just Binger. Is there any board comment, Mr. Meyer? I have just this comment. It, I would appreciate if the attachments from the first reading are included with the agenda for the action item vote. I certainly don't want a full discussion again that I don't want to, but just so the, the person who's coming at it fresh, who wasn't there for the first meeting, member of the public, it's open the agenda, all the stuff is there. I certainly don't want to go through everything all over again, unless there's something discovered, learned from public input between the two meetings. So thank you, thank you no, very thank much. You very much. 
Thank you. Ms. Willis. May I ask one question? I know it was addressed last time um, about getting, I think, iPads or maybe alternate devices for students with disabilities or some of our younger students. I'm just not sure where we landed on that. Yes, thank you for that question. Welcome, Ms. Willis. Thank you. Um, we are going through an audit process of that this school year. Okay. So really what you're voting on this evening is just for us to maintain um, our current cycle of Chromebook okay. devices with our sixth graders and our ninth graders, okay. knowing that we're full while going to be going into a full audit process with that this next school year. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Any other board comment? Seeing none, is there any community comment? There's none in the room, Mr. Price. There's no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Bailey? Yes. Dr. Hoig? Yes. Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Our next item is the contract with Career Tech Solutions. Mr. Meyer. It is recommended that the school board approve the proposed contract between the Wauwatosa School District and Career Tech Solutions LLC as presented at the June 13, 2022 meeting and I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Hoy. Any further board comment? Seeing none, any community comment? Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Ms. Willis. Thank you. Um, Jeff Fogg Pallick, 7435 West Wells. At the June 13th meeting, myself and um, a few other community members provided public comment on this item. And it's actually something we brought up um, several times before, not specific to this, but with the career tech contract, I did notice that they've helped in the district with development of business partnerships. And part of the presentation given to you also was DPI's requirement for work-based learning experiences. And I brought forward how our transition, you know, transition for students with disabilities needs to occur at age 14. And so um, our teachers, who's helping them to develop business partnerships, work-based learning experiences for our high school students and our <coughs> students in the transition program. So um, the question that was raised was, would somebody be able to, and I don't know if this happened, um, ask this company if they could also be including our students with disabilities in these um, business partnerships, because I cannot see how the staff in these programs, the staff can be teaching all day and then going and trying to find community businesses to provide opportunities for our students. So the question still is out there, who's doing that? Who can help with that? If we have a company that has a track record and the presentation showed they've done this before, can our kids with disabilities be included in that as well? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other community comment? Seeing none in the room, is there any online? There are no hands raised. Okay, thank you, Mr. Meyer. So what is the answer to the question presented in the community comment regarding um, disabilities support of the program? Do you want me to answer? You want to sure. answer? Okay, um, that is currently beyond the scope of the work that we're contracting for um, the work with Career Tech Solutions. However, um, I think with bringing on our director of uh, our new director of um, special education, definitely something that we can explore with um, that particular individual um, and in what ways we might be able to continue to support that transition program. But currently beyond the scope of this particular contract. I guess Dr. Marvel, my question would be, when we consider this contract, mm -hmm. the scope of the contract is to support our career and technical education teachers in the district. Yes. And the contractor's job is to support our teachers in developing those business partnerships. So the contractor isn't developing the partnerships. The partnerships. The partnerships. They're, yeah, they're, they're supporting the teachers. our teachers here 
to understand how to develop those partnerships. Yes. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that's, yes, that's okay. a part of it. Okay, so I just would like to clarify then. How will we help students with disabilities with business partnerships for job placements and career placements? So currently our students that um, are in any of are enrolled in any of our current CTE courses, regardless of whether or not they have um, they have an individualized education plan, they reap the benefits of this consulting firm working with that classroom um, teacher to develop those business partnerships. So right now, the Career Tech Solutions does not work with the specific um, transition program that currently exists. So it works with our students that are in our traditional high school school and in our construction classes, our CNA classes, and that does encompass students with disabilities in those programming as well. It's just not specific to um, the, tra the, the transition program. I see. So we need to find some additional resources. Yes. To help those students in the transition programs. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And you'll come back to us with that. We'll pass it on to Ms. Stacy Clem, mm -hmm. who starts on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that her laundry list of items to do has, before she's even started, it's become very long. Mm -hmm. I, if the, right now, Chris Jackson's our leader yes. with our transition programming. And I think a lot of her work right now has been focused on getting experiences and apartment living and being in the community that's been the, the, the main focus of her attention and work. Um, as we heard from the community member, to add another layer of developing business partnerships may be too much for Chris Jackson. Um, and, and so uh, what we would want to do is talk to Ms. Quim, talk to Ms. Jackson, mm -hmm. and, and identify where are their needs. Um, if we, we clearly understand that this is a desire, um, unofficially from the board and the community. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll continue to support from that perspective. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Dr. Hoyt. Would it be possible to get some data around that, around how many of our students in the transition program are, are finding placements, job placements in the community versus those that are not? So we can just kind of have a, a better sense of what those numbers look like. Can certainly um, ask Ms. Clum to start procuring that information. Thank Absolutely. You. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Willis. I have a question, and please bear with me. I have a bit of a learning curve just being newer to the district. Um, but is it just Ms. Jackson that is uh, in charge of transition services for our students with disabilities? She's our, she's our leader in that space, yes. I, would, I guess offer a suggestion. My, in my latest role under the special education category, I was a transition coordinator. And I worked in a high school specifically supporting all students with IEPs with their post-secondary plans. So I worked one-on-one -on -one and with small groups of students in the career um, setting, um, you know, just to prepare them for what they wanted to do. So it might be worth reaching out to Career Tech Solutions to find out if they have any kind of background knowledge or information about students with disabilities. And then, I mean, I know our budget is limited, but, you know, considering, uh, consider hiring designated special education teachers to work with those transitions. I've seen it done in many districts, the district I came from being included, but, you know, it's just a way to solve that. But just finding out if, if uh, Career Tech Solutions do work with, uh, you know, special ed teachers or special ed services to provide support to those students. We would love to hire uh, someone who's going to build build that, that capacity of our students sure. and their families. I, so I, I don't know if it's an issue so much of Chris Jackson's well-versed and is respected in the metro area as one of the leaders in transition services. I think it's Ms. Deb Falk, Paul Pallet. Jeez, I can't <laughs> talk right now. Uh, as Deb has mentioned, we just don't have the staff and the personnel focus on that work. If we and that's why I, mean, I use the terminology, the unofficial 
the, uh, it, the board is giving us the authority to go out and hire another position, we would gladly go hire someone uh, for this type of uh, work. I'm happy to, you know, bring my expertise and talk to the board about the benefits of having someone in a dedicated role like that, because um, I do think it is crucial to, you know, the, the success of our students with disabilities and very beneficial. We agree. Administratively, we agree. Sure. Mr. Meyer. So the purpose of the first reading thing and then vote on a subsequent meeting is that we hear input from the community at the first meeting. And then there's the thought that administration coming forward at the second meeting will have addressed the concerns raised and administration has not. And I will vote accordingly. Thank you. Thank you. So we're asking administration to possibly rethink how we can provide. Well, or as Dr. Marvel said, an additional the, data. The scope that we presented to you on the first reading and what the community member brought forth are two totally different, different conversations. So that's the reason why we haven't made the pivot. The, the original contract was presented to support our career and technical education teachers. It was not to then move into the scope of supporting special education students and getting work-based experiences. That's a very different conversation, which requires us to wait. Um, uh, our, 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 we, we are not with a director of special education right now. The long-term director of special education um, concluded her contract with the district last week. And so we're waiting until July 1st. We felt it would be inappropriate for us to leap into this conversation without Ms. Clem and without Ms. Jackson being part of the conversation. So respectfully, I would say that the scope of what we presented the first reading and what has been suggested at the microphone from a community member, which is valid and important and we're gonna look into, those are two very different concepts. And that's why we didn't make the adjustment uh, to this, con this, this contract. We will come back once we have our staff in place to address work-based uh, experiences for special education students once we have our staff in place and they can have the conversation. May I ask a clarifying question? So do we know if Career Tech Solutions, if they, if that falls under their scope of working with students with disabilities, do we know that? I don't. Currently, um, Career Tech Solutions works with students with disabilities that are accessing the general education um, curriculum and instruction in the general education setting. Um, so working with this specific um, transition program that I believe the community member is referring to is um, is beyond the scope of this particular contract um, and this particular expertise of, of this business. So we're looking at it from the, the all encompassing all students, um, including some students that receive special education services in that setting. But we're, I, I think that we're looking at also students that access alternative curriculum um, and alternative um, alternative curriculum and instruction and having the opportunity to bridge them into work-based learning experiences. And that is beyond the scope of this current contract. I understand, thank you. Thank you. So this topic will come back to us um, and I've got it on my follow-up list. Well, it's a new topic. Yes, yes. <laughs> Just, I, I want to be very clear. It's, it's an, you're, you're asking us unofficially to bring forth a new topic based on a community member's comment that was outside of the scope of what we originally presented. The reason why I'm, I'm the reason why I want to state it this way is because we administratively need direction, and if that is if we're making the pivot to looking at transition services and work-based experiences for special education students, that is significantly different than the original scope of this contract that was presented on the 13th of June. Thank you. 
we we are more than happy to dive into that topic once we have our team in place and, and once we can gather some of the, the the data such as the number of special education students currently in work-based experiences and and what are we currently doing um, in that space and how can we expand uh, i don't want to make the assumption that we're not doing anything because we haven't even explored what's the current state Understood, Ms. Fraley. So I, I, I really want to keep these two separate. And I would ask that we don't bring back just this. Like I would actually, we've had the special education audit. We yes. know we have work to do. We've hired a new team. We've got Mr. Pinion coming in, Ms. Klein coming in. I actually want to make sure that we're seeing like, what's the big picture? And this, this I'm assuming the transition program is going to be a part of that. I, I want us to be cautious of doing all these one-off things. And at the same time, I do expect within the next month or so with, with them coming on board for them to be able to say like, here are some things that we can do rather quickly versus here are things that are more long-term strategy. Um, because while they haven't started, they certainly have seen the challenges. They have heard the comments. Um, I assume that they're they're listening and watching even if they're not you know present in this moment. Um, I, I just want us to make sure that we're not being so reactive to one-off things that we actually end up shooting ourselves in the foot because I feel like we need to look at the transitions program as as a whole entity to figure out like what are the priorities are the priorities job placement are the priorities you know something else and that's where i think talking to chris jackson finding out what other districts are doing that that's something that i'm hoping we're we're being really strategic um and at the same time not creating a grandiose plan that takes us years but again looking for some of those things that we can handle quickly Thank you. Well said. And I have asked possibly for that topic to come back on the second meeting in July, the special education audit pathway uh, management response. And I don't know specifically if this would be a topic for that, but along the lines with making sure that we're connecting and, you know, of course, with strategic planning as well. So, yeah. so thank you. We, I think the board is clear now on what this vote <laughs> we're taking on, um, on this program. If, and if I may, um, Ms. Mufel, just remind the, the board and the community of um, part of the proposal in the first reading of this contract was the fact that the, the metrics that are being used to establish um, college and career readiness success is closely uh, closely tethered to the work that this particular company has done with our school district over the last number of years with helping to resurrect our tech ed um, programming in particular and just looking at how else we might be able to um, strengthen our career tech education um, offerings so that our students are not just graduating with 23 credits, but they're graduating with 23 credits plus. So they have industry certification. They have, um, they, they've had a work-based learning opportunity, for example. So that's part of what is going to help us continue to launch and catapult into um, good things for students. Thank you. Thank you for the additional input and information. And, um, and again, this will be back to us, um, but uh, for purposes of tonight, we are voting on approval of this particular agreement. Okay. We have no further community comment. And if there is no further board comment, I would like to ask Ms. Newman to call the roll. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Hoyg? Yes. Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? No. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Our next item then would be the AP exam fees. Ms. Fraley? It is recommended that the school board approve the amount of $53,508 for AP exam fees for West High School paid by families that took the test. 
and I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Jespanger. Is there any further board discussion? Dr. Means, would you? I have no comment. No further comment? No, okay. So self-explanatory. Okay. <laughs> Is there any community comment? No community comment in the room, Mr. Price? No, there are no hands raised. Okay. Thank you. I think we did have additional discussion that um, we wanted to explore possibly covering expenses for AP exams in our last discussion. Um, so seeing no community comment, no further board comment, Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Braley? Yes. Dr. Hoyg? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Our next topic, Mr. Brightman, is coming to the microphone for business services action items with the first topic of the 2022-2023 proposed budget approval. And Mr. Phillips? Sure. It is recommended that the school board approve the proposed 2022-23 budget. This budget will be adjusted in October once final enrollment, state aid, state revenue cap, um, all those figures are available and the tax levy will be set at that time. And I still move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Dr. Means, Mr. Brighton. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I'll give a little bit of an overview tonight um, prior to requesting the actual approval. Um, as you recall from the last board meeting, we went through a more narrowed um, uh, overview of the 2022-23 budget um, than we saw on May 23rd, which was kind of a longer picture compared with planning into this next year's budget. Um, just to remind you, July 1 is the start of our fiscal year in Wisconsin is a little bit counterintuitive in that really we don't get the final inputs to our budget until we're through that first quarter of our budget. So um, I did have a chance to meet with a few other board members since the last meeting, um, had some additional feedback on the budget parameters and process. Um, and I can just say we're in full agreement with administration and with the board members that I've heard from that there's a, a desire to have much more of a longer term planning approach to the budget and to start much earlier and to get inputs as we go along. And that's all that we're all on the same page with that uh, looking forward. Um, so this year is the, this next year is the second year of the state biennial budget. Um, so we know all the state sources of revenue, everything's set in statute for us. So we know what we're planning on. Uh, may not be the case a year from now as we look into the next biennial budget where things drag out into late June, July sometimes. And we're still estimating and this sometimes guessing because we don't know legislatively what they're going to come up with um, by this point in time. But at least this year we know, as Dr. Meads has said, it's a zero dollar increase in the per pupil for both revenue limit um, and the per pupil categorical aid, which are the key drivers for additional revenue authority for all school districts, not just Wauwatosa. Um, we are using our ESSER dollars for the intended purpose. So we aren't using those for budget stabilization. We're using those to help support the learning needs of students and to overcome the COVID impacts of what, what may have been out there. Um, so the state did, did increase that. There was a slight increase to special education aid going for about 28% reimbursement of eligible costs to about 30%. Um, and then also just important to note on equalization aid that the state did um, provide a lot of additional authority across the state for equalization aid to districts, but that doesn't have any impact on our budget. It just has property tax uh, reduction impacts to it. Um, so that was part of the budget that we had. Um, like I said, I've met with all uh, school board members to, at this point, um, including uh, Ms. Willis. We met uh, virtually earlier this week, um, except for Ms. Raley. We've set up, not set up a time yet, but we'll be meeting over the next couple of weeks to get to know each other and hear some other priorities that, that she may have also. Um, but like I said, it's, it's been a challenging year in a number of ways for the district and lack of budget process doesn't help. I know at a point in time like this where we're looking at approving a budget. Um, this is the preliminary budget approval. This is not the one that sets and certifies the tax levy that comes later on in the process. 
process. The point, the point of this budget is to allow things like the 3.4% compensation increase to non-teaching employees. We already approved the 4.7 for teachers, so that's already in the, in the mix. That can be uh, moved forward with, even though it doesn't happen until the September payrolls. Um, but that would be the main role of approving a budget now um, in a preliminary status. Um, so for tonight, um, I'm going to highlight a couple things that we did update in the slide deck um, that were a result of the conversations that we've had and the requests that we've had. Um, and I think it will help to start to address some of the questions that were out there. Um, I'm not, not going to go through every slide unless I'm asked to um, at some point, um, but I'll start with the um, fourth slide, which is this one where it talks about enrollment versus membership. And we talked last time that they're not the same, they're not equal. Uh, enrollment is the number of students that we have in our schools, in desks. Um, that includes, and we put a little formula in, as you can see, the, the bolded text. So that's the resident students we have attending Wauwatosa schools, plus non-resident uh, students attending Wauwatosa schools, and that equals enrollment. And again, that's how we determine capacity and staffing, section size, all those things. Uh, for me, the, the more key thing for budget discussion um, at this point is the membership. And that's what drives our revenue authority from one year to, that, to the next. And even though there's no additional dollars on the revenue of formula, any change in student enrollment, obviously less students, less dollars, more students, more dollars, you would think, but I'll show that that's actually not the case this year. It's a little counterintuitive again with the way that the formulas work. Uh, but membership is the key driver in determining our revenue authority. Uh, the formula for that is to have our resident students in, uh, plus our resident placement students in, plus the residents out. So resident students that open enrollment outside of all Tulsa schools are counted in that count. And that equals a September FTE or our revenue lim limit membership. And then from there, we have further complications. There's a summer school FTE conversion. So the summer school program that happened um, last summer is the one that drives into the, this current year. Uh, the one that we're having this summer will drive into this September's FTE and be added in. And so when we talk about getting from a resident-based number to the full membership number, it's a formula-driven piece. And I'll put a snapshot of a screen to help describe what that looks like and how that works. Um, this enrollment slide is unchanged. Here's the screenshot from the revenue limit itself. And I hope this clarifies a little bit the mechanics of how it works. Um, this is taken from the DPI audited uh, revenue limit worksheet template that we use for next year's budget planning. So the cells you see shaded in yellow are the numbers that the district submitted that have been through the audit process. Those are the actual figures. And so you can see how we add in the summer school FTE um, to September FTE, and then there's a rounding or an adjustment for um, independent charter schools, which is a newer program in the state. So just four students there. Um, but if you total up those three inputs, you then get to the 5933 uh, that we have for the 2022. That's the area shaded in pink are the areas we're still estimating, projecting for next year. Um, and then when you take the current three-year average and the lagging three-year average, so on the right side of the screen, kind of the teal shaded cells, uh, 5883 is the current three-year average and 5935 is the lagging three-year average. And because the latter is less than the top, top one, we actually get a declining enrollment exemption, which means we have less students, but we get more dollars for next year. So it's a very counterintuitive way that the formula works uh, with this. Um, so for next year, we have predicted um, an increase uh, from this lens as far as the September FTE, which is, again, based on the, the resident counts that I mentioned before. Um, the, the interesting part is if we were to flatline that 5838 to be equal to the 30 or the 5752 we had for this prior September, we'd actually lose, we did the calculation, I want to say it was $400,000 in revenue authority if we were to go down in our enrollment count. Because we have more uh, students in the count, there's that declining enrollment piece that helps us out with that. So it's just a, an interesting aspect. It doesn't happen like this unless the state doesn't put any new money in the formula. And that's why it has this funny impact of the way that it works. But for this year, it's being more conservative to show it the way that we are than to do it uh, the other way. Any questions on that piece? And then this transposes back to what you saw at the last meeting. Um, there haven't been any changes to the data slides um, in, in this presentation. So as you look at the 2022-23 line and you see the 5883, that's that lagging three-year average. So that's kind of the deltas that happen between looking at actual enrollments versus the resident counts versus what happens with the membership counts. And then there's an FTE conversion where 4K students are counted as 0.6 of a student. You know, all day 5K is a 1.0 and grades 1 through 12 are 1.0. So there's that 
complication to it all. So when you throw all that into the mix, the 5883 is that three-year average. And so we're seeing that declining of the 48, 64, and 52 over that three-year trend. Um, we aren't going into the future projections because like I said at the last meeting, I didn't build those. I like to build those myself, vet those, do a high medium low, get my head around them. Um, so we won't go into that depth in, in that area. Um, but we will as a board as we look into October, November, we're going to go deep into the projection methodologies and, and hopefully I'll come to a consensus about what seems reasonable. And we may land into a place where we have that low, medium, high is what's reasonable. And we plan around that and see the financial impact of that, um, of that piece. I think that was all we had for actual changes to the presentation piece. So I can go through additional slides if you like, um, or I can move into a couple of other pieces of information that we developed since the last meeting based on that discussion also, if you prefer. Board members, would you like Mr. Brightman to proceed or do you have questions? Mr. Meyer? Proceed. Proceed, okay. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I might need some help, Tim. And just while Mr. Brightman is pulling that up, we did have uh, a great amount of feedback around this preliminary budget, which was important. The community is paying attention. Board members are paying attention. And, um, and so uh, Mr. Brightman and his team prepared additional information, which is attached to the agenda uh, for um, everyone's viewing this evening. Yeah, yeah. so we, we did meet and you and I met last week and went through some topics also and I'm in full agreement more disclosure on the budget side is always better and so I wanted to bring this as, a, as an example of what can be used for budget understanding and approval purposes but this format also works really well for the monthly board I don't know if yes that's it's not, not it's displayed. not on zoom it's not oh. displayed on zoom Tim yes I don't think it's but it's not on zoom it's, it's zoom it's, that's the wrong this slide is not that. I, I think he wants to use that slide. Oh, whoops. That was the presentation. So we're switching over to this. It's called a supplemental. Share the entire desktop. No. Yeah, yeah that one. There right there? Yes, sir. Oh. It's the same. Which one do you want that? Okay. Thank you, Tim. That's it. Yeah. Apologies. So, <laughs> uh, so same information as we had on the screen before, but now it's in, in the Zoom so people can see it remotely and, and yourselves. Um, but it's a nice way to look at the budget. So we have on the right column the budget for 22-23. Um, the current year budget for 21-22 is still in that category. As we get through July and August, that'll convert over to an unaudited actual and then finally an audited actual. And then we have the audited 2021 budget figures. And so uh, the first page is just a different way to look at the tax levy information that we saw from the slide deck at the last meeting. So I won't spend too much time in that. Numbers all correspond directly back to what you saw on the slide deck. So a 0.21% increase to the overall levy is part of the preliminary budget recommendation. Uh, the total levy is going from 57.033 um, uh, million up to 57.150. So again, a slight increase there. Um, the property valuations we're seeing, a, a estimating a 2% increase to the property valuation trend. We think we're going to see something much higher than that. And so we'll get those actuals again in October to be able to round that out. But with a 2% increase to property values, that nets to a $7.85 tax rate. If that Equalization, equalized value goes up higher than we think, that'll bring that 785 down to something less than, than what you see here. Um, so the example property taxes on that $300,000 home going from 2397 to 2354, but again, being conservative, it'll, it'll likely be less than what we're showing here. And then just a couple of quick charts to show the trend and property taxpayers like to see that downward trend in, in both of these categories. Then we go to the second page and we call the supplemental budget information to kind of keep it clear that this provides additional context and information to the board and community beyond the approval document, which we talked about at the last meeting, which is more of a summary DPI uh, created document to give a framework um, across the state. 
Um, but the top part of this sheet looks at revenues by a, a few more categories than we saw in the previous um, information. And then the right hand side, it shows how much the budget is changing from uh, the current year uh, budget at this point. And again, that'll convert over to actual since we have those numbers um, at the end of our fiscal year. Um, but again, a little more context, the numbers again correspond to what you saw at the last meeting as far as total revenues. So I won't go into more detail than that other than looking at the, the format of this. Then we move into the general fund expenditures and the way this paces is it goes fund 10, fund 27, and it's um, specifically through the rest of the funds in numerical order. Um, but we look at things um, and one of the requests that we had was to break out salaries uh, by group and that had been seen in the past. And so we looked back and, and replicated what had been seen in the past with that. And then likewise, there's the percent increase that's in the budget right now for these different groups. And they're either a three, four or a four, seven or some variation thereof. And I'll discuss what some of those variations are resulting from. Uh, looking down at line 12, line numbers are on the left side of the sheet there. So teacher salaries, uh, looking at 23, just over $23 million for the current year budget for teacher salaries and looking at 23.8 million approximately for next year's budget. That's a 4.7% increase on the compensation model. But when we look at the vacant positions, the um, attrition savings that we have with people retiring or leaving and being replaced by other employees, we're seeing a net gain there. And so the budget impact of that 4.7% costing is closer to a 3%, 2.9% uh, with what we have in there. So that's why you're not seeing the 4.7, that line item. It is a 4.7 on the, the costing side, but again, actual people as they shuffle from what you had as actual people in March and prior to that to, uh, to model it out are different than what we see coming in for next year. So we're adjusting that as we go uh, with that. That'll continue to be adjusted and modified as we bring the budget back to the October um, adoption also. Uh, likewise, you see substitute pay, a significant drop there. We're moving from a model where more substitutes are paid internally by the district to moving more to a third party um, service that does the staffing for us with substitutes. There are still some that are provided by the district. And so um, we've been able to reduce that by about 75% in, in that line item. Uh, likewise, down on the aids for classrooms, that's a result of shifts in, in number of staff. Um, but the number of staff that remain and, and are in the mix, we get the 3.4%. Um, and then as we look down at uh, administrator salaries, uh, request was to see the actual, we have actuals from two years ago, the budget figure for this year and the budget figure for next year, that's resulting in a 3.2% increase um, with what we know today as far as um, administrator salary costs. And I think we're pretty much done with our hiring season with administrators, so I don't expect any uh, new information or additional costs there. Um, then as you look down at the benefit side, uh, you can see some of the benefits as they um, cost out and the medical dental insurance is obviously one of our bigger line items with just over $11 million. We are a self-funded plan. We do act as the insurance company, which provides us with uh, benefits to help control costs within the plan. And we're able to, to show that we're able to do that as we plan in next year's budget. Based on that, we had $11.3 million in actual um, expenditures two years ago, 11.2 million in the current year budget, and we're projecting about 11.13 million uh, for next year's costs. And the reason we can say that is we're trending right now, uh, year to date, and our plan year goes through September. The end of September uh, would be the uh, round out of our plan year. We're tracking about 15% to the positive of what we have for a budget figure. And with some cushion at 7.5% of medical trend regionally, that gives us another 7-ish percent of trend that we see. And so while we increased by 3% on the original budget scope, we've now backed that down to help make things look a little bit better in the budget picture, um, netting to a 0.7% decrease. So, so that's a question, all. Question if I may interrupt. Yes, please. of course. But the um, we're self-insured on medical, so we have to maintain our reserve. Yes, um, we do have the stop loss for um, claims over a certain amount. But are are we maintaining our our, our level of reserves? I, and all the numbers, I I just got to ask the simple question. Yes, because it's it's hard to just for me anyway. Just to, it's a new report format, so yes. Are we, are we maintaining our reserve amounts as we have in the past couple of years? We are. We are, okay. Yes, and one of the things that we'll be doing at fiscal year end is assigning a portion of our fund balance mm -hmm. to cover 
um, unforeseen health trend and claims. And okay. so we'll formally call that out in the audit reports and to the board and the community so you can see explicitly what that amount is. Okay, and then with respect to the, um, the OPEP amounts, is, is, that the, is that the amount that we owe for, re, for payments for people who have retired? Like the, we, we have our match and things like that, that we, you know, somebody earns their current paycheck and we, we put something into the retirement fund. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the costs for people due to people who, who are retired. Yeah, the liability and obligation is to both. Those that have not yet retired right. but are due the benefit as well as those that are retired and still drawing on the benefit. And so we're updating that actuarial okay. study also right now for the audit. So we'll okay. have updated information for that also. So just for context, I'm sure you know this, but this is new to the community when people start to watch. We do have uh, retirement benefits, but we have a limit on the number of people who can retire in a given year. Because of that limit, our retirement costs are steady. There's no spike in, in that. And long ago, somebody did the math. I didn't do it. People smarter than me did the math. That the, the um, new hires are paid less than senior employees who retire. Now, I'm sorry, folks, this is cold you know, finance, it's, it's the, 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 um, the fact that new hires are paid less than the people who retire does a lot to cover the, re, the, the retiree benefit costs for those people who are already retired. Now, I don't know what the break even point is and all that kind of stuff, but there's some logic to it that we pay these retiree benefits for people who, you know, the people who retired this year, the list, and now they're gonna be gone and we're gonna pay them a certain amount of money, you know, whatever for their health benefits or anything. We actually recover that with, due to the lower salary that the replacements are hired at. And this is a steady recurring year after year thing. It just kind of works out. If the fundamentals of that ever change, then, you know, I wouldn't know that you'd see that way ahead of anybody else. But that was the fundamentals to the thing that we have the annual limit on number of people who can retire. So the costs are, are level and, and there is a um, decrease in, in um, compensation for, for young people, newer people in the profession than for the retiree senior person. So it kind of works out in a way. So it's not anything we needed to worry about as long as the fundamentals stay the same. Is that Cor correct? And okay. Every other year, we have a full actuarial analysis done that's required as part of our audit to offer this benefit. And then this is the odd off year. And so we do what's called a table update, a much more summary update to that. But every year, it's reflected in the audited financial statements, what that liability changes over time. It also draws back and relates back to whatever the Wisconsin retirement system overall liabilities are. So it, it does have and flow. Um, but yes, we want to make sure what we're providing is sustainable, reasonable, controllable, and all those okay. things. So just for the community, new people come on board watching periodically that was the logic to it with with the retiree age and the and the, and the number of people we limited per year and then we, we have to hire new replacements who are earlier in their career so it's kind of a paradigm that has worked ongoing in the past okay, okay. So Brandon, how much money do we have in fund balance I guess we're going to that offhand, or yeah, I can look at the sheet here, the cheat sheet. It's about 35 million, I want to say, but I'm going to look down at the, yeah, 35.7 uh, million is what we started the year with this year. And that represents what percentage of our operating budget? Down the bottom of the page, so about 40%, just over 40%. So Mr. Meyer's question around um, the fact that we're self-funded, the, the, ability to offset additional costs that comes from the fund balance is that accurate that's correct okay. it, um, then i'll it's another question for because we don't short-term borrow we our fund balance builds up and we spend it down during the year until we get the revenue payment from the state when this is that january that well that's we the get? first property tax yeah. payment from the city of altosa is what helps our cash flow in January, yes. Okay, so the fund balance I care about is what we have in fund balance 
just before the revenue comes in, right? Yep. Because now we get, our, it's like our paycheck. We get our paycheck. It's cash flow is, yes. Yeah, how much money do we have left just before we get the revenue checks from the state? Is that, that's, because during the course of the year, that fund balance is going to be very high because we have to keep paying the monthly expenses until our next revenue check comes in. Is that's that correct. right? So. Can do you recall off the top of your head what you project our fund balance to be on what is it December thirty first or what what's the day that's the benchmark date? I have looked at cash flow um, history. I haven't done a projection yet for this year. I want to say it was in the four million dollar range. Okay, at low point this last year or a couple years ago. Right. So that that's the one I really worry about is is just before the revenue comes in, how much is left in the bank? Because if that drops below zero, then we have to short term borrow. Right. Okay. okay. And we have questions on other line items in the budget, such as purchase services, supplies and equipment, and where do we increase or not increase? As you can see on the right side, we really didn't make any increases to any of the purchase services or um, equipment expenditures. The places we do have increases in the 4.8% the for the private school voucher aid deduction, as well as the intergovernmental, intergovernmental payments for services, which is open enrollment. Um, you can see those are increased, but those are increased by the model based on numbers of students that it projects that we'll have in those different categories. Um, and then likewise in supplies, you're not seeing any increase from the current year budget in those line items either. So we didn't reduce funds, but we didn't, didn't add to those budget areas either. Uh, likewise in capital expenditures, those are purchases over $5,000. Um, the debt retirement um, piece that you see there, um, and then insurance and judgments, as well as some other expenditures. Gets us down to the bottom line, which again corresponds to the numbers you saw at the last presentation, but a little bit more context to it. And again, what I like about this is if the board likes this format, you can then see the same format as a monthly tracking tool throughout the year. And I think it's, a, it's an easy scan to see where we're pacing as we predicted, and maybe not sometimes. And then if we're not predicting, tracing is predicted, we can explain why that is. And there's always an explanation for what that might be a timing difference or, or something that came up that was a one-time event. So we can put that up to explain what, what's happening. Keith, where does a sub substitute salary pop back out? Is it in purchase services? <laughs> Correct, yes. Yep. So there's no change there? Correct, we're able to absorb that within okay. existing capacity. Okay. Yep. And I won't go through each fund, but Fund 27 Special Education Fund, again, is laid out with the different revenue sources that we have. Um, those are done throughout the, the, with the financial model that we use to help predict what those might look like. Um, broke out the expenditure on salaries by categories again uh, in this area. Um, employee benefits, same type of structure that you saw um, in Fund 10. Um, and then we go into a little bit more summary information on the rest of the funds. I apologize for scrolling so quickly. Um, but debt service is where we pay the principal and interest payments for the referendum approved debt. Um, and so you can see for 21-22, there were no payments. That's part of the payment structure we have to optimize aid impact for the district on taxpayers. Um, but next year we return to having a doubled up uh, principal and interest payment as part of that. Um, fund 41, this is the capital project list, which I believe is the next agenda item to talk about with, with spending some of these resources. Uh, we have a $500,000 levy and the $700,000 in the budget as far as a, a spending authority. But as you know, we bring all projects separately from the spending authority to the board to get approval. And tonight, I believe it's $230,000 of spending authority of the 700 that we'll be requesting board action on. Um, if we decided at some point as a board and, and as a recommendation, we will bring that back to increase the budget line item if necessary, otherwise just project-based to add up to that $700,000. Um, as Greg will mention, I, we have $3.8 million, million remaining after we would have the levy increase of five, or levy of $500,000 and the expenditures of a full $700,000. So we have some room there to, to entertain other projects if they were to come up. Uh, fund 50 is our food service fund. Again, putting some additional context to it. Um, and looking at that, this is a very tricky area to predict for this year. The last two years have had significant federal dollars associated with this. We're returning to pre-COVID now funding at the federal level, free reduced uh, lunches and authorizations come back into play. Um, food prices, as you know, are inflated, but yet we've done a lot to be more efficient with what we're, how we're purchasing and doing more cooperative purchasing. So there's a lot in the mix here. So that'll be another one to um, more fully vet between now and October and they really trace throughout the next, the next fiscal year. But we're in a healthy place with, the, with that fund also. 
Um, and then the community services program, the main drivers of this are the CE and rec program, as well as the liaison officers that we have uh, in the district. So um, again, looking at a healthy fund balance for our fund 80, both uh, starting the year and then ending the year with a balanced budget in that context. So that is a little different format. I've liked this format in several districts. Elmbrook used this, Menominee Falls used this. It's this clean way to look at, at things with enough detail to be able to feel like you understand without getting too deep into every single line item. Obviously, every line item is available. One thing we don't have here that I mentioned a couple of times is the finance committee structure, where it's nice to have a group to go deeper in the budget on. Um, and we can entertain that, whether it's a monthly or quarterly or standing or as needed type of uh, committee structure looking forward, but um, but that's kind of this piece. Any questions, I guess, on this one? So I have a comment, and this is informative about where my vote's going to go. That $4 million on December 31st, and I know it's a rough, rough guess. It's not, you know, you haven't gone, get out the calculator. I haven't looked forward yet. No, right, right, right. You weren't prepped for that. So the budget spends money and we feel okay spending money because we have assumptions about year two, year three, and year four, about enrollment, about costs, about what we can do with salaries and benefits. I am much more of a pessimist than most people. So I don't agree with the assumptions about what's going to happen in year two, three, and four. Now, I don't want that to be heard as a criticism of your work. That's to say that I tend to be the harbinger of doom and often I'm wrong, but every once in a while I'm right. So I believe things aren't going to go well in years two, three, and four. And therefore, we should start to build up that December 31st fund balance to cover those, those, the downside risk of those of our assumptions not turning out as favorable as we think. So therefore, I think we should be spending less in this budget to squirrel away some more money so that we can absorb um, bad events with regards to our enrollment and not, and if, if, if the assumptions turn out favorable to us, the outcomes, then happy day, then we have money, we can, you know, do capital improvements. But so that's not, not a question here, but my observation about why I'm going to vote, I think we should be more pessimistic about fundamentals of year two, three, and four. And I could be wrong, but I have to vote with what I, I feel is, you know, is 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 how I should vote in order to avoid risk of short-term borrowing. That's thanks. That's all, all I have to say. Super, I have a question. Auditors, when they look at school district budgets, what do they normally recommend a school district that's self-funded? What percentage of their operating budget do they recommend a district should have? stored and reserved. Yeah, with the self-funded benefit structure, again, we're acting as the insurance company and we hope to have more positive years than negative, yes, um, but we are gonna have negative years. And so to, to help protect us from that, I would say in the 35% range would be where they'd be. If you're a bond rating agency and you're looking at a district across the country and you're wanting to rate them based on their financial capacity to be sustainable, and in a solid financial position, it's at least 25%. If you had self-funding onto that, you're up in the 30% range um, because you do need that additional cushion because you're taking on that additional risk. And so hopefully you get the reward, but you also have the risk uh, built into that. So that 35% is where I would land as far as a minimum to have. And right now we're at that 40% level. I'm not suggesting that we spend that down. Um, this year, it's I, we do have a deficit position position, but I, I consider this more of a timing difference. We receive federal revenues that were just timed off of when we need them for next year. And so... This is a conservative budget. I've looked at it from that lens. Um, there are a number of conservative elements built into this budget. I mentioned the enrollment on the revenue as being one of them, that if we have uh, less kids than we're showing, we actually get more money for next year. And that is just a strange 
piece to that. So there are things like that in the budget that will help sustain us through the next several fiscal years. Um, we'll work hard to position the district so we're in the best position we can be. You're right, there are so many unknowns out of what may come out of Madison for the next biennium. Um, it's hard to know right now, the economy, as you know, is extremely strong in the state. Inflation pressure or benefit to the state on the sales tax collection side is not yet released for the current updated uh, piece, but that's coming, I believe, later this summer. We'll have a better idea of what that impact is on the state revenues, and that'll help, help position for the argument that schools need additional resources in the next biennium too. So um, I think that'll be optimistic. Uh, the statewide lack of use of the COVID relief dollars um, may be an issue for at least year one of the biennium, but that's going to take a lot of education with our local legislators to understand the intent and use of how we're using the COVID revenues, how the districts are, and why we're pacing it the way that we are through the, through the process. So it's just, it's going to be a lot of conversations. The legislative advocacy is going to be key for this biennium. Um, as I mentioned before, I like doing that work. I like that, that engagement. Um, I think I have built credibility with legislators that I don't position things one extreme or another. I try and bring them in as they really are and have real conversations about them. And so um, I think you said something very important. I just want to slow it down sure. and make sure everyone heard it. You referenced that across the state, most school districts use their COVID relief ESSER three funds to do what? For what I call budget stabilization. And that is about 80% of the COVID relief dollars you can use for any purpose, a board or a district can use for any purpose they like. And so you can supplant, meaning you can take what would have been state funding increases for inflationary cost increases, and you can use those federal dollars for any purpose for that. And so you inserted a warning to us, and your warning was that. And I want to clarify, yeah. I want to make sure I heard you correctly, that legislators will there will be a mirage, if you will, that legislators will say, well, most districts were able to sustain themselves because you had the ESSER funds. So that means we don't have to do certain things in support of school funding moving into the next biannual. Is that what I heard you say? And that wasn't actually the angle I was thinking. So the, the I was. Okay, the piece I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm worried about the, the big five districts in the state and the billions of COVID dollars that they received and their inability to even be able to spend those, whether it's construction projects or higher staff. It's just not possible to do that much with that much volume of dollars. And so when they look at their spreadsheet with a bottom line number of billions remaining, they're going to make that assumption that that's statewide impact so we're we'll on both sides Co yeah. so either so it's actually you made it even worse you made my point worse <laughs> so you're suggesting that some school districts will not utilize all their ESSER funds and legislators will say well why give you more money you didn't use what you received from the federal government there will be others who were able to sustain their budgets as a result of having the federal dollars and legislators will come back and say well if you were able to do it that way with that limited amount of dollars maybe we can incrementally give you more on a per pupil perspective. Correct, yeah. So incremental is important looking forward, but there's also the backfill. And I mentioned at the last meeting, the Joint Finance Committee did put in that $350, $400 million as a placeholder to have as a kind of a placeholder for a starting point for the next biennium. So we're a unique, we're a unicorn, if you will, as a school district, because we're actually using our ESSER funds for what they were designated for, which is services to students correct most districts due to the the tightness of the last state budget they they were forced to use their dollars to uh, to stabilize their budget correct okay. yep. and that's not just a wisconsin thing that's a nationwide thing a very low percentage of districts are using their ESSER money for students Okay. Is there any further board discussion? Can I ask, um, Mr. Mayor, you mentioned you would, if it were up to you, you would like for us to cut our costs and squirrel away some more money. Where would you, what would be sort of your proposal for where you would cut those costs? What would you like to see? Well, in some senses, it's too late now because we've increased salaries on temporary funding. Um, 
I don't know where we cut costs right now. We've already reduced the capital budget. We're going to see that tonight. It's down to like less than half a million. Um, those, those are really hard questions. If, if, if the happy assumptions don't come true, then we have the degree of pain we'll have to, to balance the budget in year three and four will be worse than what we would face now. So um, there are programs that we do, and I don't want to get it. Well, you know, we do things that we, we hire coaches, we hire consultants, we've hired a lot of administrators. I mean, and we've already voted yes on those things. So it's sort of too late, um, really. Um, I don't know, you know, we'd have to go through as a board line by line, according to what we see in this priorities in the strategic planning process. So maybe this fall, um, August or this fall, we start looking at planning for scenarios. What if things don't go well, what will we do? Because if we, if things don't go well and we wait until it happens, then it's going to be a frantic set of awful board meetings, you know, to lay people off and things like that. And we don't want to be at that, you know, sudden moment of truth. Like we find out in March that we're short. And now we, 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 and this did happen over 10 years ago, we came up short and we almost had to lay off 36 teachers. Um, but we increased open enrollment. So we got caught that day and we were surprised. And now we don't know that we want to increase open enrollment anymore. So I don't know where we, we get the money from. I appreciate the, the clarification question. Um, I think it's for those meetings that we have later this year to, to, to scenario this out to say, what will we do? And, and, you know, Dr. Means has mentioned that we are, we, we, we're spending money on things that we aren't monitoring outcomes. And Dr. Means has plans to provide, you know, the monitoring of the outcomes to see, you know, a lot of things are well intended, but are they working? So we have the data analyst tonight and I voted yes for the data analyst. You know, we need to really see what's working and what's not. Um, so there, it's not an easy answer to the question. It's a very difficult answer and a long process, thoughtful process to get to it. And so I would just say for the board, I think you all are aware and um, for the community who, community that's watching, this is the difficult part that we're in as administrators, because earlier this evening, there was a lot of angst around Ms. Foch's report on staff. And one of the main components that staff have shared is that they would like to see a salary increase. Well, to Mr. Meyer's point, the question, and, and, and to his credit, Ms. Munville and, and Mr. Meyer in particular asked the question on March 14th, is this sustainable? Can this be sustained? And, and so I, I think this is strategic planning that the board will have to wrestle with. We administratively, we would love to create the, the, the services and the positions that people who come to the microphone say we should have. We, we understand what best practice says we should have. There's also a financial reality of what we can ultimately do and what we can afford. Um, I, I think the points that have been raised this evening are outstanding. Yes, we do use our fund balance to avoid short-term borrowing and that that has helped us with our bond rating for many years in this district, and we're, we should be proud of our bond rating. Um, it shows a level of fiscal prudence. There's no doubt about it. And if we are, I think one of the things that we should do um, as with strategic planning is to have some type of external study on our long-term en enrollment projections. Um, and and there, there are people in the state, uh, I think of Sarah Kemp and uh, Applied Lab, 
let uh, apply population lab. I, there's there's a, there are other um, there are other uh, organizations nationally, but having that type of analysis would be helpful to this conversation. But I think what you're wrestling with, with right now is an outstanding um, governance issue of what's your vision. Uh, is your vision to be more fiscally prudent? And I think that is a, a good philosophy to to have more in your fund balance than not, because that's how we use our fund balance. We don't short term borrow. On the flip side, you have other competing uh, issues. Uh, you, you hear when you're in the community, when you're in schools, you hear from staff. We've only talked about teachers tonight. Our educational assistants are they're waiting on us to sit down with them to have the same conversation. But how do we justify and, and, and balance the conversation of maybe we should have a more prudent, fiscally conservative approach and then say, but we want to pay everyone as well. That, that is just, it's a tough spot to be in. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to having that, that conversation with the board in the future. No, I, I believe the fundamental choices are win the enrollment competition and what can we do to increase the high school enrollment when, when people decide where to put their young, their children, parents for high school and the kindergarten competition. And we've kind of wandered away from focusing on that. And, um, and the alternative, well, the worst story would be you go to one high school and one middle school and close to elementary schools and then you're, you know, eliminate non-resident activity and then our average state aid per pupil goes way up, but that's not the Wauwatosa community. So if, if we leverage who we are as a community and win the enrollment competition, then, then everything works out and that's how it has worked out. Um, but I think we've lost focus on that because we've been so successful that you know we kind of got took the eye off the ball on on things about what does it take to get parents to send their ninth grader to our high school and that if we focus more on that that would be be the suggestion mr mayor yeah. and i'm asking for history's sake for my own uh, edification it's my understanding but correct me i'm uh, sharing you as well it's my understanding that at, at one point the district had a position that wasn't so much a communications position, but it was a community relations position. And a portion of that person's job was to address resident enrollment and to ensure that we were sustaining a, a steady and strong uh, position uh, among those students. Is that accurate? Well, when you were still here, Dr. Means, we, we started the marketing committee yes, that yes, looked exactly at that. And, you know, I'm 65 years old. I don't know what a, what a 32 year old parent looks for. We need to get some people at the table who know what matters to them. Maybe it is equity and diversity and inclusion, or maybe it's wraparound programs. I mean, we don't, I don't know, you know, if, if we, I don't want to you know, rely all on one thing and have the assumption be wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we started those things when you were still here, Dr. Means, and maybe yes. we need to get, get back to that. We had marketing and advertising experts on that committee and and they started to do literature and, you know, various things about, you know, and we could see with our, we have a data analyst now, six, you know, black, black belt. We could really start to target some things and know whether they're working or not yes. with, um, you know, with, with enrollment. Yeah. I would just add, we added schools. We added different types of schools. We changed and added different types of programming that the students and parents told us they wanted and needed. Um, I, I mean, the, if we focus on it, we'll grow. I, you know, again, you have to focus on it. So, um, yeah, yeah, we we did the STEM the. Yeah. It, it has different generations in it, but the STEM school at Wilson, Wilson is essentially a one section school for neighborhood enrollment. And we opened the STEM school. We opened the Montessori school. We have a second STEM school now. You know, we, we started to, you know, to believe, you know, build it and they will come. Well, for Wauwatosa, it works because people like to live here. We just have to have 
you know, is a track to fix. We, I, you know, it's a plan to succeed um, rather than, you know, a, a, a pessimistic outlook, but you have to decide if you're going to succeed. And all these buildings are revenue generating engines, every one of them. So if we keep them all open and put schools in them that, that young parents want, we, we should be able to win that. We, we need to ask those parents though, what they're looking for, because I won't, I know to ask them, but I don't know what the answer is. Mm -hmm. Is there any other board comment before I open it up to community comment? Okay, we'll take community comment then on this topic. Hi, uh, Paul Fuchs, uh, 4080 North 99th Street. Oh, so a Whitman parent. Um, I'm just seeking a little bit more clarification. I apologize because I just this evening kind of scanned your document, but um, I'm kind of curious, uh, hot topic as of late, um, it's the relationship with the Wauwatosa Police Department and the SRO services. And I was just kind of curious where that landed in expenses, um, if that's under intergovernmental payments for services or, or what, where would we find that number? If that's open to a response, thank you. I'll let you do that. Yeah, so that's actually included in the fund 80 numbers that you see. So the, the main components there are the seat and rec program and then the school police liaison officers costs are also in that fund 80. So thank you for the clarification. Fund 80. Yes. This is where the SROs are. Correct. Okay, wonderful. Is uh, I don't see any other public comment in the room. Is there any online, Mr. Price? Yeah, we have <clears throat> one hand raised. Uh, Kendra Kobar, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, this is Kendra Kovar, 2405 uh, Merlin Way, Brookfield, Wisconsin. I'm an eighth grade teacher at Whitman Middle School. And I have a comment that aligns with Mr. Meyer's concern regarding the costs involved in the positions that are continually being added to the district that have no direct contact with students. In particular, I'm speaking of the academic coaching, for example, literacy coaches, math coaches, equity coaches, innovation specialists, et cetera. Please note that the contracts of these coaching positions are categorized as teachers, yet they never provide any direct instruction to students. The district is continuing to create these type of academic coaching positions that do not appear to be financially dependent upon the revenue that's gained based on student enrollment. Yet classroom teaching positions are being cut for the upcoming year based on lower enrollment. For example, 3.75 FTEs were cut from Whitman. As noted in the media and school board meetings, Whitman is the school in need. Uh, the positions being cut um, involve daily instruction for students and the elimination of these FTEs impact face-to-face -face instruction with students and have a direct influence on student learning and student engagement. If the district is truly focused on closing gaps and raising achievement, achievement why is it cutting positions that directly serve students with quality face-to-face -face instruction instead of adding the positions that are housed in offices, oftentimes at Fisher or in other places far away from students? Additionally, if we are a data-driven district and we're going to continue to use these academic coaching positions, I have a few questions. Is there data that proves that these academic coaching positions have improved student learning or have begun closing achievement gaps? If there is data, what have we learned from it? And then what specific evaluation tools are being used to collect data on the success of academic coaches? Because if we're truly if these positions are truly supporting our best practices, why aren't we evaluating the quality of them and the outcomes of the positions? Lastly, I think it would be valuable to gather data from teachers about how much support they're actually receiving from these academic coaches on a day-to-day -day or weekly or monthly basis. Because I personally had no contact in our building last year from a coaching position that we had in our building. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Is there any other online comment? There are no more hands raised. And I think we're ready for the roll, Ms. Newman. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? No. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Newfeld? Yes. 
Our next item then is the proposed capital improvement projects. It is recommended that the school board approve the revised proposed capital improvement projects for 2022-23 and I so move. Second. Thank you. Just for the new board member, I am Greg Chuinski, the director of Buildings and Grounds. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, I don't, I won't touch too much on this, but um, I do want to first say thank you um, for two weeks ago. Um, appreciate the input and the feedback that we did receive um, from the board and community comments. Um, so based on kind of the direction that that went, that that went and the directive of the board, um, we have uh, revised the uh, capital improvement projects uh, that we are proposing at this time, uh, removing the uh, renovation of conference room E off of the list. Um, still leaving um, East High School, Conn and St. Tank, Roosevelt Mason repairs and Madison main entrance. Um, I would like to say that we did explore some other options um, for ADA accessibility um, as well as safety and security. Um, there would not be sufficient time prior to the start of this school year coming up um, to be able to complete any of those. And I think, and I'm going to reiterate the fact, the importance of this updated study that we will be getting. Um, I, I think it's important that we get that. I think it's important that we unfold it. I think it's important that we get board input, community input before making any further decisions on what comes next with that 3.8 million or 3.9 million of capital uh, capital expansion funds. Um, so I, I don't wanna you know, just take stabs at throwing the money out there. I, I think we really need to sit down. We need to take a look at this study and figure out how we use that money going forward. Um, so Madam Chair, I, if I may, Greg. You may. Uh, I, I think it goes back to what Ms. Farley said earlier. We, we wanna be more strategic with our work. So what will happen is uh, once the, the report from PRA on all of our existing facilities uh, is completed, um, and it takes a look at all the life cycle components of plumbing, roofing, and electric, and so on, um, it's gonna also consider uh, what are the best environments for a 21st century school, uh, because of many of our schools are, are older. Um, and we have kids who are growing up in 2023 and above. And so how are we making the adjustment with the learning environments to best meet those, those needs? We will reconvene the facilities advisory committee um, that will be reconvened to look at this work. It will eventually be brought to the board uh, for you to, to review as well. These are all components to the strategic plan. So we're looking at things in a very comprehensive strategic approach versus a project here or a project there. I think often in my analysis my, of my first year here, um, due to our, and I think it's been mentioned earlier tonight, uh, administratively, we haven't been as strategic as I would like us to be. Um, and so subsequently, community members voice individual concerns. We have to make sure that we're very focused on the strategic um, approach and not, I think you used the term, Leanne, uh, the one-off project. We, we want to do that. We want to make sure that you have your, we have your stamp of approval on that strategic work um, because then it, it clarifies where we're trying to go as a district when, when we have that type of work. And, uh, thank you, Griff, for letting me. Absolutely. Add into thank you. Is there any other board comment, Mr. Meyer? So Dr. Means, you uh, communicated to the board that um, IT would be moving to the Wilson building. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? They're moving. Um, we're, that is a placeholder Wilson. We may actually have a better location for them if things work out at Wallatose East. Oh, okay. Well, either way, I recently retired from IT, <laughs> application support work, and it was always favorable for us to be closer to our users. And um, so I'm real curious to see how that works out. And I don't want to go off of my 
preconceived notions, but to have the IT department actually in a, a full classroom building, um, that might actually turn out to be a good thing. Maybe not, but I certainly am interested in knowing how that, what the outcomes are from the IT department's perspective as to whether being closer to the to the users is a is a better thing or or not. Maybe it's not. Maybe my manufacturing um, company experience isn't transferable to K twelve. But I I definitely would like to know how that goes. Uh, Mr. Meyer, I can comment to that. Currently. Um... The large, the large majority of uh, technology support services team members are already in those buildings. Okay. Uh, the people that are here in the Fisher are more the network administration, operations, and management side. All right. So we can work from anywhere. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. But Thank nonetheless, you. Mr. Mayor, I think your point is is a good one, and we're hoping that we it's either Wilson or Walter CE. Please note that. Some of our technology teams are already at Walltos East. Mm -hmm. If you are familiar with the building, they're right off of the loading dock. Okay. Uh, and so that's their home base, if you will. Yeah, that's and so the loading dock is really important because that's where a lot of the materials come in. Okay. Um, so we're, we're hoping that Walltos East can be that location. Greg and his team are working with Mr. Hughes to finalize. Ultimately, this is a Mr. Hughes um, issue um, because we'll also, it also impacts, I believe, in a positive way, um, the Walltosa Virtual Academy, and it also it impacts our, our GED2 program. Okay. If we can find bigger spaces uh, for those two programs as well, we think we can. Um, we, we actually will benefit three programs at the same time. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any other board comment? No. I will just um, add, I want to add to your work. So the building-based budgets that we use to make enhancements, that's not included in the capital projects we're talking about. No, any budget that I would have with, with operating fund 10 or what have you, or small projects or what have you, as far as I know, is not being impacted this year because it sounded like everything was staying the same. Yes, um, yes. thank you. So and I just want to There would still be you. some... Yeah some smaller projects that will be done as as things do arise just nothing capital expansion wise i guess i would say yes so i just wanted to compliment you and your teams in the buildings because every day you're doing work and doing things that assist the building and assist the students absolutely which is excluded from what we're voting on immediately from the capital budget that's correct so we're continuing to address needs as they come up most definitely okay <laughs> yes okay uh seeing no further board comment is there any further community comment none in the room mr price is there any online no there are no hands raised Okay, wonderful. Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Oh, Ms. Lewis? Yes. <laughs> and I am a yes as well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, our, our next item then is the waste and recycle pickup service agreement. Ms. Fraley, really exciting. Um, it is recommended that the school board approve the waste and recycle pickup service agreement as presented at the June 13th, 2022 meeting. And I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I have nothing to add. Okay. Any further board comments or questions? Uh, is there any community comment on the agreement? Seeing none in the room, Mr. Price? No, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Holt? Yes. <laughs> Dr. Chessa Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Uh, next topic will be the HVAC service agreement. Dr. Jessup Banger. 
It is recommended that the school board approve the annual HVAC service agreement as presented at the June 13th, 2022 meeting and I so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Mr. Meyer, is there any further board comment? Is it HVAC? HVAC, yeah. HVAC, heating, okay. ventilate, it's heating okay. ventilating, air conditioning, and um, <laughs> I'm losing my words. But yes, HVAC or HVAC is appropriate. <laughs> okay. I don't see any further board comment. Is there any community comment? There's none in the room, Mr. Price. No hands raised. And none online. Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. Our next item would be the translation agreement. Uh, Ms. Dr. Hoyt. It is recommended that the school board approve the agreement with Argo Translation and invoice dated May 9, 2022 in the amount of $11,929.04. And I so Second. Thank you. And is there any further board comment, questions? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Hi again, Deb Falpelli. I just wanted to follow up as we're talking about saving money. Um, with that invoice for nearly twelve thousand uh, dollars, when it was posted, it was for translating one IEP uh, for twelve thousand dollars. So I know we had a community member who their company has to have a lot of reports translated, and she came and talked about how much that typically costs per hour. So I'm wondering if there, you know, and I know Mr. Brightman's new in the in the finance department, you know, is this an invoice that we're being overcharged on $12,000 to translate from English to another language for one IEP seems like a lot. So I'm not sure with this company that we're contracting, are they, have we looked at other companies that do translation services too, that could maybe help us save some money? And that one particular invoice just seemed like we're going to be using a lot of our money. Um, certainly we have to translate these. These are legal documents to help our families and people who can't, you know, that English is not the language they need to have things in. But I don't know if anyone's looked into this to ensure that we're not getting overcharged or um, something that's really pretty significant for one report. Thank you for your comment. I see no other comment in the room. Mr. Price, is there any online? Nope, there are no hands raised. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Um, may, may I ask a question oh, first? Yes, Mr. Meyer. Uh, okay, um, can we please find out whether there are different price levels for different certification of translation. If, if, if I'm preparing a translation for a pharmaceutical bottle, well, that's one thing. If I'm preparing a translation for instructions to operate a nuclear reactor, well, that's one thing. How well certified do these translations have to be for the purpose of the translation such that maybe there's a lower cost <coughs> for a less certified translation. I, I have no idea, I've known nothing about this line of work, but it, it seems at least by some kind of common sense that different uses would have different needs to have that translation be like exactly precise versus, and I don't want to be disrespectful to anybody, but you know, operating a nuclear reactor isn't the same as telling somebody what they're, you know, you, you, know, you can have different tolerances for different idioms or words or whatever. And maybe that's the reason why this costs so much. That this translation is much more certified than what it needs to be for the purpose it's being put to. 
Uh, I had something. Oh, oh. Okay, uh, Ms. Willis. Sorry, just okay. as a special education teacher, I think it's pretty critical that the IEP get translated pretty accurately. I mean, we're talking about instructional minutes, maybe related services, what kind of accommodations the child might get. I mean, just from writing IEPs from start to finish myself, I mean, I think it's pretty critical that you have, you know, it's very, very precise and very clear. Right. I'm, I'm not saying it's not critical. Okay. Sure. I'm saying <laughs> that there certainly are uses in the translation world that, if wrong, will blow up a building, you know, melt down a nuclear reactor. And th this is not that kind of a use. Um, but, but maybe there aren't choices. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, but it can be very detrimental to the student if they don't get the services. I understand that. Needed. I understand that. But there is, are we using scientific translators or are we using educational specific translators, for example? You know, if we're hiring somebody who's typically doing scientific translations, that's a different type of translation than um, an education type of translation. That's that's all I mean to say. I don't mean get a second rate translation. No, absolutely, I'm, no. We need we need the right translation here. But are we using the right type of service for the type of translation we're getting? Thank you, Mr. Meyer, Dr. Hoy. I mean, I think this is a really good question because on the face, this looks astronomical. I think what is probably missing from this is some of the context that is that it wasn't just to, to translate a document, but rather to also interpret, to be present to interpret for multiple IEP meetings, which can be hours in length. And so I think when you right. when you think about it in that context, and you think about it in the context of some languages, there are gonna be lots and lots of interpreters <laughs> available, and the cost is probably different than those languages that are less common in our community where you may have to pay a premium to get those interpreters right. to come. So I think those are all things to just kind of context yep. of this yep. cost. Yep. I'm not doubting the cost. I'm only saying is it the cost has been raised as a question, even the cost raised from the um, from the community that, you know, the IEP, you know, um, stakeholder community. So they're asking the question. It's a good question. Uh, what are what are the what are the reasons why it does cost what it costs. And there's probably a good reason, but let's, every once in a while you find out, oh, we really didn't know, you know, small chance, but maybe. Thank you, Ms. Fraley. Um, so I think it's a good question. And when I looked at their website, to your point, Mr. Meyer, they do do lots of different kinds of translation and education is one of them. So I looked at okay. that and Kenosha School District is one of their sort of like recommenders, et cetera. And that's not to say we should use them. Um, and I think for me, it begs the bigger question, which is can trust but verify? You've heard me say that a couple times lately, <laughs> Dr. Means. Can we just ensure, and this is on you to make sure that this is happening, that there was a process to select this particular service um, and if if there was a process that was used and we feel like it was a good process and that we selected this person or this organization because they do look like they have very high quality but again it could be that they only have one person that can translate Chinese or Vietnamese or whatever you know Arabic um, so I think the board doesn't need to know the details so much as just know that there was a thoughtful process and that it wasn't somebody just said, oh, well, let's just use Argo because they're right here in Milwaukee, um, which again, the old Liam would have assumed that there, that process happened and the new Liam is like, I just want you to know that that process actually happened. <laughs> Trust but verify. So. I will vote for this because it needs to get paid because the work was done. But I think just moving forward for Mr. Pinion or Ms. Clem to know that that is, you know, something the board expects to have happening. Thank you. Um, and again, um, we commend um, the community for coming forward and asking questions. Thank you, Ms. Falk-Palak. Um, 
But what should the board yes. do with this tonight? <laughs> now we're going to all practice saying that. You know, what should the board do with this tonight? We have some options. We could table it until we want. And, and say we want more information. It's okay, no board I member wants to do that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we board. want to proceed with the action. But what we don't seem to be good at is coming back with the feedback loop. True. So how will we come back with the feedback loop and what direction as a board are we giving to Dr. Means? That? I mean, and please let me clarify again. If I'm seeking translation of a legal document or a court pleading, there is terminology used by lawyers that is rarely used in common language. There's terminology used by lawyers that would not be in an IEP. So if if and that terminology is the the, the, the legal terminology. It, it's a it's a different level of translation. I'm sure they're going to get paid well for that. We need a translator who does educational document translation. We don't need a legal document translator. We don't need a, a chemical specification translator. Let's be sure we're getting the right translator for the purpose involved. That's all I'm saying. Does your phone have one more comment? This, I think, underlines again the work of the Legislative Advocacy Committee in pursuing and supporting resources for the legislature to follow through on their 60% threshold of providing resources to school districts to provide support to students. Um, so I, I would also echo Ms. Fraley's comments of, I'm, I will work under the assumption that you are working to find the best translators at the best cost. And if that's part included in part of the board memo when things come forward, that's fine. Um, but I'm good with this and I would ask that we call the question. Can I just um, offer one? I'm sorry, can I offer one more? Well, well we, we, we have a call to question, which is not debatable. Sorry, I, don't understand. I didn't understand that part. <laughs> can you clarify what that means? Um, Call the question is typically a non-debatable action to call the roll. Oh. It expedites the process to vote. So in other words, it, it says. It tables the conversation. Yes. Let's just go. Okay. okay, it's getting late. <laughs> so we are at the point, we've had community comment, we've had board comment. We will call the question. We will call the roll. Ms. Fraley? Yes. Dr. Hoig? Yes. Dr. Jessup Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfield? Yes. And we're giving direction to Dr. Means to validate the process of translations. I don't know what that means. You and I will need to work on that. <laughs> so. I don't. Well, and it's, it seems like this is more of that process related stuff because we're spending a lot of time talking about a $12,000 bill instead of how, what are we doing? What is the bigger role of what we're doing? So I appreciate the transparency of, of all of this, but also it takes up all the time in these meetings and we have no time to do the bigger stuff that we're actually tasked to do like strategic planning and creating policy, there's no time for it. And so this kind of comes back to my previous statement of this is this is good, but our agendas are so packed, we there's no time to orient you and I to what we're doing here. Thank you. I can, uh, I can Madam Chair, I, I can share with you, there was no RFP process to lock in a translation company. What happened was we started finding more needs for translation. It exceeded the threshold under policy 6320, which went over $20,000, which they rarely do in, in the ELL multilingual world. And out of due diligence and adhering to the policy that may not have always been, because we're trying to address your trust but verify component, we brought it forward. So I, I can put that in writing to you, but that is what happened. 
Um, and that's why it's being presented to you now. <clears throat> okay, thank you. The uh, motion is approved unanimously and um, the process may be discussed at a, for, at a future meeting. Okay, um, next item, approval of the Echelon apartment lease for July 2022 through June 2023. It is recommended that the school board approve the Echelon apartment lease for July 2022 through June 2023 is presented in the June 23rd, 2022 meeting and I so move. Second. Thank you. Is there any further board discussion? Is there any community comment? No community comment in the room. Is there any online? No, there are no hands raised. The motion's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it's as presented at the June 27th, 2022. 13th, sorry. Mm -hmm. Ah, there's a typo. Friendly amendment. I second your friendly amendment. So, um, so the amended, uh, the amended motion is to change the date uh, to June 13th, 2022 meeting. Okay. And so I guess we will call the roll on the amendment. I believe if nobody objects to the friendly amendment. We can just call. We okay. can just call the roll. We can have a friendly amendment. Okay, to update. Okay, so no community comment, no further board discussion. We have a friendly amendment uh, to update the date to June thirteenth. Um, Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Fraley, yes. Dr. Hoy, yes. Dr. Jessup Anger, yes. Mr. Mr. Meyer, yes. Ms. Willis, yes. Mr. Phillips, yes. Ms. Mewfeld, yes. Thank you. And that concludes the business services action items. Um, we'll now move along to pupil and family support action items. Dr. Means. The first is our cooperative education service agency uh, service contract that we reviewed on June 13th. Thank you. Ms. Fraley? It is recommended that the school board approve the service contract for the 2022-2023 school year between CESA 1 and the district for services and personnel totaling $331,588.26 and I so move. Second. Thank you. Is there any further board discussion? Dr. Means, was there any other information? Okay. Is there any uh, community comment on the CISA 1 service contract? Seeing none in the room, Mr. Price? No hands raised. Okay. Uh, thank you. Just a comment for myself um, because I am a CISA 1 Board of Control member, I will be abstaining. Um, then seeing no other uh, comment, Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Braley? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Abstain. Uh, next item then is uh, approval of renewal of the license and support agreement for Infinite Campus. Dr. Jessup Anger. It is recommended that the school board approve the renewal of the license and support agreement with Infinite Campus for the 2022-2023 school year as presented at the June 13th meeting and I so move. Second. Thank you. Is there any further board discussion or comment? No? Seeing none, any community comment? None in the room, Mr. Price? No hands raised. And none online. Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Braley? Yes. Dr. Hoy? Yes. Dr. Jessup Anger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes. And business services report, uh, monthly reports for May 2022. Um, Dr. Means, Mr. Brightman? I'll give it to Mr. Brightman. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, the report has been provided to you. Um, it's similar in format to what you've seen in the past, and revenues and expenditures are trending as would be expected for May in a given fiscal year. Okay. Thank you. I would also note that I have a hard copy of the detailed check register here for anyone in the room who wishes to view it. Um, is there any board discussion on the report or comments or questions? Yes, Dr. Jess Banker. Mr. Bryman, you had commented earlier about utilizing the kind of the format for the budget that we had talked about, looking at that at year to date and there's, that's something that I would find beneficial. Um, so the idea of a finance committee being in place is something that we consider as a board and, and whether or not we put that forward as a group decision, but I would like to explore uh, in providing you support in that way. I know Mr. Phillips or Digits, as I like to call him, has certainly done a lot of work there, but I think a committee may may make some good sense going forward, but I think having a year-to-date report utilizing that, I would welcome. Okay, thank you. Our uh, final item is uh, public comment on items on the agenda or items not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the room who would like to comment? Uh, no, none from the room. Is there any uh, anyone online, Mr. Price? Yeah, we do have one community member that wishes to speak. Julie Alexander, you have the microphone. Please state your name and address. Hi, my name is Julie Alexander, 7224 West State Street, Unit 1A, Wauwatosa. Um, I just wanted first off, thank the board for its... Uh, detailed discussion on items because it was really interesting to listen to. Um, the second thing I just sort of thought I'd mention is that um, I am hoping that there is a way that uh, the board or the, the school district can come up with a plan uh, coming, you know, succession plan for this coming year or the coming next school year just even start up with a plan to really look at um, employment possibilities for students with disabilities. 75% um, of students with disabilities are unemployed and it would be great to see if there'd be a way to have the Wauwatosa School District help with that. And I know it's a strong, or strong, a strong issue and it may not happen for this year, but really looking at seeing if there's a way of coming up with uh, a strategy for that in the coming year to implement in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. Any other comments online? No, there are no more hands raised. Okay, uh, then uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Thank you, Dr. Jeff Sanger. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Fraley. Um, uh, Ms. Newman, would you call the roll? Ms. Fraley? Yep. Dr. Hoyt? Yes. Dr. Jessica Banger? Yes. Mr. Meyer? Yes. Ms. Willis? Yes. Mr. Phillips? Yes. Ms. Mewfeld? Yes, and we are adjourned at 10.41 p.m. Thank you, board, and thank you for the community.